I read this to you last week. I just kind of want to recap and build on kind of what we talked about last week about going to God's garage. We're going to take it a step further today. Lord willing, in the creek behind me don't rise. It says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, this is the New Living Translation. It says, For the word of God is alive and is powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword. It cuts between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes, and he is the one to whom we are accountable. And the prime target of all this is the Word of God. The Word of God changes everything and everyone. Uh, this is the month of Breshit, where the Hebrew people study the Word of God from the beginning. And the Hebrew word Breshit literally means in the beginning. And in the beginning, God. You could stop there. You could put a comma. You could even put a period there. He existed before all things. And what he did was speak. And what he said was, let there be. And when he said that, it beed. <laughs> it was, however the English says that. <laughs> he spoke the world into existence, and one of the last creations was, was mankind. And when he made that person, he made it in his own image, from the dust of the ground, breathed into him the breath of life, and he commanded him, be fruitful and multiply. And he couldn't rightly do that until there was Eve, and then we had Eve, and he said, whoa, man. Whoa, man. No, nobody? Okay, never mind. <clears throat> I know, felt, felt flat there. Whoa, man. All right. So here we are. Spirit, soul, and body. The creation of God. And uh, as we sit here today, we experience this thing that God calls salvation. The Word of God calls it salvation. Because we need a saving, don't we, boys and girls? And uh, I think you're pretty much aware of this fact, that religion doesn't save anybody. Ideas don't save anybody. Laws kept or broken do not save anybody. Only one thing saves people. And it's better than a thing. It's bigger than a thing. It is God himself in the flesh as Jesus Christ. That is our salvation. Everybody with me on that one? Good. I want to read something to you from Romans 10. And I want to talk about salvation, spirit, soul, and body. Because all three of them in you, need a saving. Uh, I look back in Deuteronomy 30, and I kind of got some insight into this part of Romans 10 that I won't read, but I'm going to actually pick it up uh, in Romans 9. But, but the, the pickup part that I read and studied in uh, um, Deuteronomy chapter 30 was God did not make his word or his ways unattainable to you. He did not hide it in heaven, and he did not hide it in the lowest depths of the earth or in the bottom of the sea. But the word of God is near you. It's even in your mouth. When you quote the word of God, you honor him. When you quote the word of God, I'm not talking magical thinking here. When you quote the word of God, when you say it out loud, the universe, the universe says, wait a minute, I know that. That's not you speaking. That's God. That's His Word. His Word is eternal. It's quick. It's powerful. It cuts through, if you don't mind me saying this, it cuts through the crap. The Word of God doesn't play games. The Word of God does the job. And in our case here, the Word of God brings us salvation. Let me read to you in Romans 10. I'll start with verse 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. 
For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God. And it is by confessing with your mouth that you are saved. Verse 11, as the scriptures tell us, anyone who trusts in him will never be ashamed or disgraced. The Jew and the Gentile are the same in this respect. They have the same Lord who gives generously to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And, and, and how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why the scriptures say, how beautiful or how lovely are the feet of the messengers who bring forth good news. So, the word of God has been spoken through all centuries, through all time. He said, let there be, and there was. He said one thing to Adam and Eve, you guys know this, you've heard it a million times. Do this, and it will be cool. Do this, and you will die. Choose this one, or choose this one. He gave them a choice. Now there's theological debate on that. Uh, you can get into, but ultimately, they chose poorly. They chose wrong. Now when Adam and Eve were created, they were not ashamed. We read this in the book of Genesis. Uh, they were naked, but there was no shame. There was no sin. There was no guilt. There was no self-consciousness. And as they were created perfectly in the image of God, they, their spirit was good inside them. Their soul, their thinking was good. They were probably brilliant. They were probably beyond genius mode. They were definitely Mensa. <laughs> okay? And their bodies were pure. I mean, perfect. They didn't need to work out. They didn't need to join a gym. They didn't need to watch their diet. They just, it was just naturally perfect. Spirit, soul, and body intact. And when they disobeyed God, when they chose to take that fruit and listen to the serpent, on that day, their spirits died. They were no longer in tune with God. They suffered in that garden a spiritual death. That is what God meant when he says, on the day you eat thereof, you shall die. What did the serpent say? You won't die. Well, he was two-thirds right. Because their mind was still alive, and obviously their bodies were still standing up. They just weren't whole and complete and perfect like God created them anymore. They were fallen. They lost their connection with God. Their spirit inside them died on that day. And they've passed that on to us all the generations right so the spirit of God needs to come to us how does the spirit of God come to us through the word of God which is alive quick and powerful which is able to get through all the crap in your life cut through the spirit the soul the mind all this stuff and penetrate it and get you back online with God Get you back in tune with God. So on the day you guys accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, when you surrendered, I can't do it on my own, Lord. We all have a story. I've got mine. Uh, you, you've all got yours. Some are more dramatic than others. God has to get through thick skulls. Sometimes he has to drag us through so many things before we get to the point where we accept him. I, I, like You guys know my story. I've hold it probably a million times from this very pulpit. The first time I heard about salvation was from a very dear friend of mine from high school. He was a black man. Uh, he played bass guitar, and I was learning how to play guitar, and we were jamming and having a great time. We were playing Hendrix and Beatles stuff and Zeppelin the best we could. We were butchering it. We were doing a terrible job. And, you know, he was learning how to play bass guitar, and he was really getting good. And I was playing guitar, and I thought I was good, but... I listened to old tapes, I wasn't, I, I thought I was great. Anyway, we took a break, and we're sitting down, and I don't know how the subject got to this. My, my friend, his name's Marcus, uh, he said, my aunt was just telling me the other day. Now, his aunt was heavy into church. Uh, Marcus got drugged to church, 
but by his own admission, he didn't understand anything that was going on. He didn't know what any of these words meant. But he said to me, I may have been 15, 14, 15, around that age, I cannot remember, but I remember where we were sitting. And he says, my aunt told me that unless you're born again, you're going to hell. And I remember that hitting me like a ton of bricks. That's how I heard the gospel. It wasn't dressed up. It wasn't neat. It wasn't seeker sensitive. It's like, do this or go to hell. That's how it was presented to me. I don't know how you heard it the first time. I'm like, wait a minute. I, like, I think we were drinking iced tea. I like, almost spit my iced tea. I'm like, what did you just say? He says, yes, you have to accept. According to my aunt, he, didn't, he wasn't speaking from personal experience. He says, according to my aunt, you have to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior and repent of your sins or you're going to hell. I'm telling you guys, that's exactly what he said to me. And I immediately knew he was right. I didn't question what he was saying. My statement to him was, why didn't anybody ever tell me this before? I mean, I'm 15 years old. I thought I knew everything, right? How could I have not known this? How could I have never heard this? I visited churches from time to time, not often, because I was not a good boy. <laughs> but I didn't. My parents weren't churchgoers. They didn't force me to go, so I just didn't go. I knew zero about the Bible. I knew zero about Christianity. But the first time I ever heard the gospel, that's how I heard it. That word spoken was like electricity to my soul. And it changed me. I couldn't get over it. I have to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Or I'm going to hell. I couldn't escape those words. I know that sounds harsh. But ultimately, if you boil it down, that's true. Jesus doesn't want you to go to hell. That's why he gives just good news. That's what gospel means, good news. So my thinking, of course you know, if you know me, I know this is true, I know this is right, but I'm having too much fun drinking and smoking and carousing and rocking and rolling with my friends. This is for old people. This isn't for young people, the salvation stuff. So I'm going to put that on the back burner and pray against all odds and roll the dice here that I'll survive to old age and maybe have the presence of mind when I'm much older, after I've had all my fun, I'll accept this Jesus because I absolutely believe he's true. I mean, he's ama I've always felt Jesus was amazing. I just never understood anything. And nobody ever explained him to me, ever. The first explanation I get is, accept him or go to hell. I'm, I'm serious, that's what I got. And I knew it was true. So um, then the Lord started bothering me. He started plaguing me everywhere I turned. It was Jesus this, Jesus that. And then ultimately, you know the story, my girlfriend got saved. And then she drugged me to church. And then I accepted the Lord and everything changed and I was born again. Well, long story short, salvation occurred in my spirit. Because of the finished work of Christ, he, di he died according to the scriptures, rose again according to the scriptures, ascended on high, he is seated right now at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for all of us. And one day, the Father is going to tap him on the shoulder and say, go get him, boy. And he's going to come back. And those who are dead will hear that voice, that trumpet sound, and they will meet him in the air. And we who are alive and remain at that time will be caught up together with them and meet him in the air. This is all future tense stuff. This is, this is stuff coming. And uh, what am I going to do right now? You know? So my spirit is now turned on. I believe he's real. I believe he's my savior. But my brain isn't in tune yet. So although my spirit is connected with God and the lights are turned on and I'm able to read the Bible and kind of get something out of it for the first time in my life, the spirit of God inside me helped me understand it little by little, very slow. But my way of thinking, you guys know this, I was a blockhead, man. I didn't know what I was doing. I talked a lot, but I didn't understand what I was even saying. I talked through my bottom a lot, I must say. I, I, I was trying to tell people about Jesus because I really felt a love for him, but the words I used were not great or sophisticated or even educated. I couldn't quote, quote scripture because I didn't know any. All I know is Jesus good, devil bad. You know, like a caveman preaching, you know, whatever you want to call it. So this process of my intellect my attitude over the last 40 plus years, like I, I, I talked to you last week, God has taken me 
to the woodshed so many times to deal with my thinking or my misthinking or my speaking or my misspeaking, <laughs> which was the majority of the time. So many times, even though I was a Christian, even though I was going to heaven because Jesus saved me, my brain was dysfunctional. My attitude was bad. My whole reasoning faculties needed transformed. And if you read in Romans 12, I quote this all the time, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. This is Romans 12. Uh, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then it goes on to say how you will learn the perfect will of God. So the spiritual part of you hears from God and learns his will by the intellect of you being under the sound of the spoken word of God, which gets in between your ears, rattles around, cleans house as it goes, changes things about how you think, how you feel, all the chemical reactions that we all naturally have, that we relied on all our lives, and now we're learning that wasn't the best way. There's a better way. And we learn through our salvation of our souls, our psyches, our intellects, the renewing of our mind. This is a process. We learn as we read, as we study, as we pray, and we change, and we become transformed, and our mind gets renewed by what? by the hearing and hearing of the Word of God. So, our spirits are saved. Done deal. Our intellects, our soul, our thinking process, we are a work in progress. We are a work in progress. None of us here are perfect. We don't think perfectly. We don't understand entirely. We see through a glass darkly. But as we go, as we submit, as we learn, as we change, we kind of see more and more, and he turns the lights on more and more as we get into it, right? Now, I've talked about the spirit. I talked about our soulish, what the Greek word for our soul is psyche, uh, where they get the word psychology, the study of the human mind and the emotions and all the inner parts of you that, you know, that the needs dealt with and healed. So many of us do need healed that way. Uh, and then we got our bodies. Well, obviously... Our bodies aren't saved yet. <laughs> our mind is in the process as we learn and study and pray. Our spirit is already saved. So you've got one done deal, one work in progress, and then the last thing on the equation here is this body. What do we do with this thing? Well, we dress it up. We give it a new paint job every seven years. <laughs> we work out. We try to watch what we eat. We try to do this and not do that. And, uh, you know, some, of the, some days we win, some days we lose, right? It's a, this life in the flesh is, a, is the struggle. I mean, this, this body enables us to walk around and to live and move among our brothers and sisters. But this thing here, I, I don't want to be negative, but if you have a picture of yourself 20 years ago, I'm not talking about you kids. Hold up the picture of you 20 years ago and put it against the one right here. If you, if you could see, my, this guy's dying. <laughs> He's dying, man. He's, not, he's, a, he's a, a vague resemblance of what he was, you know, and it is true. I meet, uh, I meet friends of mine that I knew back in high school, and they say, oh, you haven't changed a bit. And I say, you liar. You are a liar. I'm <laughs> nothing like I remember when I graduated high school in 1979. I weighed 145 pounds soaking wet. I had really long brown hair, and I had a terrible slouch. My, I, my back was all hunched over like this, and, and I always got told about it. I always got told about it, and I never did nothing. I just had lousy posture, so when you measured me, I may have been 5'10", 5, 5'11". Five, Depends on how straight I stood. After I graduated high school, right, I, uh, I, got, I got it in my head, well, if I just throw my shoulders back and stand tall and get used to that, I'll look more like a man and less like a freakish, long-haired cousin it kind of thing, <laughs> right? So I decided when I get up in the morning, I'm going to make a conscious effort. I'm going to throw my shoulders back and stand tall. And after doing that for quite some time, I, I had to go get a checkup or something. He did my height, and I'm like, 
5'11 and dot, dot, dash, dash, not quite six foot, but I'm as close to six foot. If I wore heavy socks, I'd probably be six foot tall. So, and then they weighed me, and I weighed 165 pounds. And, wow, almost a year and a half after I graduated high school when I was this, bleh, I turned into this Adonis. <laughs> Man, I was good looking. I'm like, I could have used some of this back in high school. This would have really been great. Where, where was this body when I needed it? Where I could have stood up to the guys in the hallway, hey, who are you talking to? I didn't have that. I was like, you know, I had to cower away. So the body, th I'm a late bloomer, right? And obviously you can see my bloom has bloomed, and now the leaves and the petals are falling off. That's just life, right? So I... Because I'm familiar with the Word of God, because I have a profound trust in Jesus, because I'm learning and studying and my mind is being renewed, I have this hope that one day this bag of bones and this crumpled up flesh that you're looking at right now, this blah -bitty blah on the microphone to you right now, is going to be redeemed one day. And on that day, when I stand before the Lord, I will be complete like I was supposed to have been had I been born in the Garden of Eden in the lineage of Adam and Eve, just like you. We fell because we disobeyed. We turned off the lights because we were selfish. The devil said, you'll be a god unto your own self. You'll call your own shots. And that's what we do. That's our natural inclination, to call our own shots. And Jesus comes in and says, I can call it better. If you trust in me, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. He will direct your path. I just spoke to you the Word of God. That Word I spoke to you is alive. It'll never die. And that Word that I spoke to you is not my imagination. It's the Bible. And it, it comes from God, and it will return to God. He said in Isaiah 55, like the rains come down and soak the earth. He also said like the snow comes down and covers the earth. You know the difference between rain and snow, of course, temperature-wise. But rain comes in, soaks the ground, and it gets right to it. Snow's a little bit slower. It sets on you for a while. It kind of chills you for a while. And then slowly it gets absorbed into your earth or into your psyche or into your body or into your soul or spirit. It takes a little while. And I think that's been mainly, mainly my story, the snow. <laughs> You know, I'm a slow learner. It takes a long time to penetrate this cranium, right? And, but once it gets in me, it really takes root, and it affects a change. So this whole thing I'm talking to you about salvation, it has to start, ladies and gentlemen, by responding to the Word of God. When you do so, when you hear the gospel, however you heard it, maybe you heard it, God is love, God loves you, God wants to bring you into his kingdom. Jesus died for you. He wants to present himself. Oh, that sounds so nice. I wish someone would have said that to me like that, but no, you're going to hell unless you're... I mean, that was my deal. But it's all true. It's all true. God does love you. I bet I could call on any number of you right now, and you could quote to me John 3.16. For God so what? That he... So that would not, but have. See, that's the Word of God. That's life-changing. That's the message that throws the switch in you and makes your spirit alive. That's a done deal. The soul, the, the, the renewing of your mind, that's happening now. That's called being discipled. Right? And the body, well, <laughs> it will be saved one day. Uh, I, I, my advice to you is uh, treat it as good as you can. Uh, you know, we're not all tall, we're not all short, we're not all this, that. We've got to just take what we got and do the best we can with it. But we know one day we will stand before the Lord changed and transformed, and this mortality shall put on immortality, and we shall be glorified in His presence. This is His will. This is His word. So your body will be saved. And I always talk about in my own case, uh, the Fabio thing. Does that, are any of you familiar with Fabio? 
had that long blonde hair and everything, and the, he's muscular, and he had the sexy accent and all that, you know. I can't believe it's not butter, you know that guy? <laughs> but I always say, uh, you look at me now, and I'm, you know, I look like this Asian guy, but when you see me up there in heaven, I'll be like Fabio. <laughs> this baldness shall put on unbaldness. This physique, I won't have to work on it anymore. I'll be cut and ripped for eternity. And I will say, I will govern you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I still can't believe it's not butter. You know, that's my joking destiny. That on that day, my body will be saved. My body will be restored and healed forevermore. No more sin, no more sickness, disease. I won't need glasses anymore. I mean, that is my inheritance as a believer. But guys, religion gets this all backwards, doesn't it? Religion is rules and regulations. And some churches out there throughout the centuries have lost their minds and have not read the Bible anymore, and they're trying to inflict upon people religion. You must behave a certain way. First, get your body in line, and then only say what we tell you to say don't speak contrary, but my mind's thinking, no, nope, shut up in your mind, make your mouth say the right thing. That's religion. Act right, dress right, quote only King James when you're speaking of the Bible, rules, 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 and then maybe if you're a good boy long enough, just maybe when you meet God, he's going to be angry at you, and he's like, oh, right, come on into heaven, you might as well, I guess you behaved yourself. That's what religion says. The Bible never says that. In essence, the Bible's saying, hey, sinner, come. Come to me, all you who are weak and heavy laden. I will give you rest. But the Bible is replete, replete, replete with this word. We cannot ignore this word. We cannot forget this word. You must repent. Come as you are, but do not stay as you are. This gospel, this churchianity stuff that says, you know, we're going to ordain homosexuals and we're going to do this and that. We don't care what gender you claim to be today. Sorry, guys, that ain't the Bible. It may be fuzzy-wuzzy good modern thinking, but that is not the Bible. I mean, you want to talk about science, you go to the DNA. DNA is a code. It ain't no accident. That's hard science right there. It says you're going to be this tall, you're going to have blue eyes, you're going to be this, that, and you are a male or a female. DNA, DNA does not get it messed up. We get it messed up. But God made us who we are. And the closer we get to him, he will explain to you who you are. This is our salvation. It's, it's at once a done deal, and it's at, in another way, it's a process. And it is also a future event. It's all those at the same time. So ask yourself in all sincerity, am I going through the motions? Am I acting the part? Am I just saying what i got to say in the right place just to get by, just to get through? Am I just taking my body to look good here and look at it? Or am I really in touch with Jesus Christ? Do I legitimately, like the Bible says here, Believe in my heart. Have I actually confessed with my mouth that Jesus is my Lord and there's no other? Have I officially renounced my sins and repented of my old ways and chosen to follow him all the days of my life? Now, we all stumble and fall, of course, nobody's perfect, but made that conscious decision. As Jesus released his disciples into the world, he told them this, Go! And tell everyone the gospel. Tell them to repent and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, baptism is important. Baptism is a big step in discipleship. When you, when you submit to water baptism, you are being humble. You are, in, in, in essence, recreating the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. You are, in, in a physical way, displaying what has already happened in you spiritually. I'm no longer 
it's no longer I that liveth, but Christ that liveth in me. In the life that I now live in my flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Baptism is an important step in discipleship. Now there's some that argue that you are not saved until you are water baptized. I do not agree with that, but I would still call those people my brothers in Christ because, hey, it never hurts to go under the water in Jesus' name. But if, uh, my, my point is this. If you do not believe in your heart, you go down a wet center, a dry center, and you come up a wet center. The baptism itself does not save you. The risen Lord Jesus Christ saves you. And we learn this by his word, his word that is powerful and sharp. It cuts through the bull. I'm sorry, I'm just going to say that because that makes the most sense right now. Genuinely saved, genuinely sold out to Jesus, and you're not ashamed to publicly display it by going and taking the dunk and coming back up and living warts and all in front of the whole world to see, in Jesus' name, learning, growing, changing, and painting this body the best we can to get through this life, taking our vitamins or whatever we need to do, whatever doctor's advice we need to get through. Yeah, but one day we'll have a glorified body. That's part of our promise. But unless we turn that switch on or allow Jesus to turn that switch on and submit to him, we're still lost in our sins. You could sit in a pew for the rest of your days. If you haven't made that firm commitment in your life, you're still lost. That is not a popular message. That is not a message. Because, hey, I could lose people. If I, if I start telling people the truth, people are going to stop coming to church. You know what? I'm surprised you came anyway. <laughs> Tom Millis is going to be there? Gah! Why? You're here by the grace of God, and I thank you for it. Because it'd be mighty lonely without you, like I say. But it ain't about me. It never was, and it never will be. I'm damaged goods that God looked into and says, I can use a guy like that. I can take the foolish things of the world and confound the wise. I've never been to college. I drove through a couple. Stopped and had lunch at a couple, but I never went to college. I took an online course. I got ordained. But uh, you know, I took a course in bibliology. I took uh, courses in uh, the book of Romans, the book of Acts, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. I've been studying and asking questions for well over 40 years and going to Bible studies and praying. And the Lord called me to stand before you all to teach, and I do the best I can with what I have. And, and if I don't put the Word of God out there, I'm wasting your time. I'm not here to entertain you. And if I say something that offends you, I hope I offended you with the word of God and not my obnoxiousness. <laughs> God loves sinners. And yes, my friends, we are all sinners. We were born sinners. Paul, the Apostle Paul says, Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Now, if the Apostle Paul thought he was the chief of sinners, where does that leave me? Paul had to repent. So Paul, he was big into religion. He, had, he was way into his Hebrew religion. And in his mind, in his thinking, you can read this yourself in the book of Acts, chapter 9 and 10, that area, uh, he was going to wipe out this church because he felt the, this new way, following Jesus, whoever that is, he thought that was going to mess with Judaism and, and Hebrew and, and the way of the Jews. So he set out to destroy it. That was his heart and that was his thinking. And on his way, with letters, warrants for arrest, on his way to Damascus, he was going to find Christians, chain them up, bring them back, put them on trial, and stone them to death. Right? That was his mission. That was his agenda. On his way, a bright light shone on that road to Damascus, knocked him on his face in the ground. And a voice spoke to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Wait a minute, man. That's my religion. These are the things I do, man. This is how I operate. This is my operating system. I, I, I follow the law of Moses, right? And I keep that, and these people are messing with it. So uh, what do you mean persecuting you? And, and, and Paul looked up at this voice in this light. He says, who are you, Lord? Can you imagine? <laughs> 
Oh, he won't get you. He's tame. So he said, who are you, Lord? Didn't know him. This guy who studied the Old Testament his whole life, a Pharisee, didn't know who was even talking to him. And Paul had a life-changing experience right there. I am Jesus, who you are persecuting. So Paul had a revelation that day, right? Everything I've been about my entire life has been wrong. My whole mission, my whole agenda has been wrong. So Jesus met him on that road, changed everything about him. He was blind for a few days. And uh, he got healed, and then he went and got water baptized, and then he started learning and growing. He went out in the wilderness of Arabia, and he met with the Lord, and the Lord revealed to him all that stuff about the Old Testament. All along was talking about me. It was the Word of God that changed Saul into who we know now as Paul. It was the Word of God did the transforming work in him. And I, I've read history books and, and different commentaries about Paul, uh, from what I understand, he was not a handsome man. He was short. He was, I mean, most accounts say he was bald. Some people he said he had really bug eyes and they were kind of mangy looking, sick looking eyes. And, and some even say he had a big crooked nose because he got beat up so much for being so obnoxious and forward. And, and some even say, some of the accounts say, he had a really screechy, unpleasant voice. So reading his letters, that was one thing. But when he was with you, talking to you, you might not want to listen to this guy for an hour. You know what I'm saying? But this guy, when he turned around, when the Spirit of God reached in him and clicked the lights on, I'm telling you what, he changed the world. God used him to change the world. His agenda changed. His attitude changed. And that creaky, squeaky old body that he walked around with, it's going to be changed on that day. All the departed spirits uh, are with Jesus now, but when those bodies, whether they're in the belly of a fish, at the bottom of the sea, in this burned out building, God knows how to work all that out. I don't understand how he, he does the resurrection thing. He's got that worked out. But when Paul, on the day of resurrection, meets his new body, and his soul and his spirit, he will be complete in heaven. And you and I will be standing right there with him. Completely saved. Completely restored. This is the heritage of all Christians. Now why am I harping on all this salvation stuff? Why am I talking about this? The word of God comes into your life. And it changes you. You respond to it. You confess it. You repent. And if you need to... I encourage you very strongly to be water baptized. I, I encourage that very much. We can get that done for you. You approach me. If that's something you want to do, if the Lord's put that on your heart, we can, get, we can make that happen for you. I'll dunk you. Haven't lost one yet. <laughs> if you hold them down too long, they call that a drowning. I haven't done that yet. As long as I bring you back up and you can still breathe, mission accomplished. But think about that. Think about if you want to sell out and really be 100% Jesus and do that publicly. That's, that's an amazing thing. Be his disciple. Pray, read, study. Get to a place where you can hear the word of God regularly. Grow, change, and eventually the end of your story is you physically will be glorified. Right? If you have that hope, if you have that desire in you, if you have that reality taking root in your soul, this world is not going to bring you you're going to say, I'm just passing through. It's a shame all the stuff that's going on. Hey, wherever I'm at, I'm going to bloom where I'm planted. I'm going to make an impact. I'm going to stand up for Jesus and what's right. I'm going to stand up for my family. And if I have to, I'll stand up for my country. I'll do everything I can. Yeah, but this world is not my home. I'm only passing through. If you have that attitude, man, it lifts the whole burden of this, the cares of this world. Have any of you ever read Philippians 4? This is like the impossible chapter. Philippians 4. Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are lovely, 
whatsoever things are of good report, if there's any worship, I'm sorry, any praise, any virtue on these things, think on these things. And the God of peace will be with you. That sounds so simple, but that is like one of the hardest things to do. Don't you agree? Because we live in a world full of bad news. We live in a world full of bad vibes. We live in a world that, unless things change, we ain't got much of a future. So if we're invested into this world, we're going to get mighty low and discouraged. And it happens to Christians. It happens to me. We can get mighty low and mighty sad and mighty down. I have to constantly remind myself who I am, whose I am, where I came from, and where I'm going. And when I get that established in my heart, my attitude lifts. My spirit lifts. My hope arises like, like sap in a tree in the springtime. And then little leaves, little branches, little flowers, and then fruit Pop, 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 comes out, and I can, I can bear fruit for the glory of God in this dark, crazy, messed up world. And I think of that scripture, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Let this word of God dwell in you deeply. Rightly divide it. Study it. Show yourself approved. A workman that need not be ashamed. Like I said, rightly dividing it. That you can be whole. That you can be okay in the midst of the not okay. Is this encouraging you in the least? Last week we talked about God taking you apart and putting you on the, in his garage on the workbench and, and, and exchanging this for that and replacing this and that and then rebuilding you and then taking you out and, and letting you run free. You know, we all need that from time to time. I cannot tell you how many times over the years, how many times I have been to God's woodshed. How many times I got off on my tangent, my thinking, my emotions, my this, my that, and God had to say, whoa, 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 whoa. Come here, come here, come here, come here. Slap the head. Come back into the garage. Let's take this apart. And uh, I hope I didn't, uh, I hope you don't think I contradicted myself last week when I was talking about this. I, I talked about presenting yourself and then I talked about God grabbing you by the scruff of the neck and taking you to the woodshed. Uh, both of those things happen. But it's better if you present yourself. Right? Don't ignore things to the point where he has to grab you by the scruff of the neck and take you to the woodshed. He loves you. He wants what's best for you. He knows exactly what you're going through. And he put you there. Does that sound cruel and harsh? Yeah. Where you are right now, he means you to be there. And he means to bring you through it. And he means to make you better on the other side of it. You believe that? Well, there's a thing called the Word of God. Though I travel through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. That's the Word of God, friends. That's what makes the difference. That's what cuts through the bull, the Barbra Streisand, the Bruce Springsteen, the Britney Spears, whatever you want to call it, the BS, <laughs> right? It's the Word of God. The Word of God says this, repent, be saved. Come to Christ. Give Him all. He will heal you, restore you, and He will glorify you. Believe that with all your heart. Put your hope and your trust in Him. In the things of this world, yeah, they're, they're still bad. But you'll be able to endure them with a smile on your face. How about that? Huh? I'm going to ask Mackenzie to come up. I want you to think about those things. Think about yourself. And I want you to, I don't, I don't mean to judge anybody, but I want you to ask yourself, do you know that you know that you know that you know that you upon your last breath are going to heaven with Jesus? Is there any doubt in your mind? We're going to settle that with a prayer when this song is over. So you think about that. Close your eyes and pray this prayer with me. Say it out loud. Say this, Father in heaven, 
Forgive me of my sins. I present myself to you and ask you to save me. I believe Jesus died for me and rose again according to the scriptures. I accept him as my Lord and my Savior forever. I dedicate myself to follow Jesus all the days of my life. God help me. In Jesus' name, amen. Father in heaven, I pray for everybody out there. I pray that everybody in here prayed that prayer by faith. I pray that the word of God has touched their hearts and their souls. I, I, I pray for your transforming salvation for everybody in this room. I pray that all fear, all doubt, all hopelessness, all despair, I pray all physical illness, all, all things that would just enslave us and enchain us, Lord, would be broken in the power of the name of Jesus Christ. So, Lord, save, heal, and deliver. That's what you do. That's what your word says, and we believe it. So be with us this day, Lord, and bless us. Uh, bless our fellowship. Bless our families, our friends, and our neighborhood. For your glory, we ask it in Jesus' name. Everyone say amen. God bless you all. Hope I didn't offend you too bad. If not, I'll try harder next week. Uh, please join us for pizza downstairs. And uh, stick around. And also, if you want to walk over and, and check out our siding on our shelter, please do that. Otherwise.